Great. So I, I think Jay probably needs no introduction to everyone who's here to uh, listen about Transformers. Um, I think all of us have kind of started by trying to read the attention is all you need paper and gotten completely confused by this crazy architecture diagram and then immediately gone to Jay's super influential uh, blog post called the Illustrated Transformer where he really nicely shows um, kind of conceptually how these things work. And then there's a whole series of uh, beautiful blog posts ranging from Pandas to NumPy to G BERT, GPT, I mean, the whole works. So thank you, Jay, for this amazing service you've done to the community. You've kind of demystified Transformers, um, which is amazing. And today, um, Jay's going to talk to us about a gentle visual introduction to Transformer models. So I'll add... Yep, great. You got your thing there. And, Perfect. Um, Are we okay on audio? All good. Amazing. Thank you so much. That's a very kind introduction. Uh, happy to be here uh, speaking about uh, Transformers. Uh, there's a, a couple of examples on a notebook. This is a uh, URL to it, but it's uh, you know just a very simple sort of sort of notebook um, to go over. Um, to to give some um, uh, let's say history, um, these are some some milestones from the history of writing, right? So uh, first time sort of people put um, drawings on tablets. Um, and then people put language, carved it, carved their laws of an entire, let's say, society on, on a column. That's Hammurabi's law, the second image uh, below. Then people started using paper. Um, and then we have something like the, 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 the printing machine or the printing press that sort of um, pushed the next, let's say, revolution. And books became cheaper to get and knowledge and literacy became uh, easier. Uh, so once you need a book, you don't need to go and copy it with, with your hand. Um, that sort of changed the world. And I do have a sense looking back at the history that NLP via sort of what machine learning is, is enabling us to do, that we could be at, at, a, at a historical sort of turning point. Where exactly are we, did it happen the last uh, two or three years? Or is it going to happen in, in the next uh, few years? Um, it's very hard to tell if you're not sort of looking back into history, but I'm extremely fascinated um, by these uh, sort of language models, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit why. So yeah, just a, a brief uh, bit about myself. I, I've been blogging about machine learning and uh, transformers. Uh, machine learning for maybe five, six years, a transformer sort of since uh, I wanted to understand the paper, and this is sort of a map that I used to, for me to understand the paper and it turned out to be uh, useful to, to other people uh, as well. The blog has gotten about 4 million page views just because the, the topic became super interesting to, to, to people. And then I wrote about other types of transformers as well as NLP technology. So embeddings, word to vac GPT-3, BERT, and I do some, some videos on, on YouTube as well to sort of explain some of these. Um, I do work at Cohere, um, as, as sort of uh, Thomas mentioned, we work on large language models. We offer sort of large representational language models, kind of like BERT, and large uh, generation language models, kind of like uh, GPT. So these are massive language models via API for people to experiment with and, and deploy in, in industry. So this is the uh, URL, and we're, we're hiring at the moment. One thing to allude to uh, that Thomas mentioned is that Transformers has taken NLP uh, by storm, uh, but not only NLP, but also like computer vision, and it's like going out of out of NLP. This is the the super glue, um, and you can see that Transformer and Transformer based models uh, have, have have dominated the leaderboards. Um, if you go and search on Google, so it, I have bring up this example for people who sort of want to understand a little bit more of the current applications. So if you go on and to search on, on Google um, and you type some, some words and you get some recommendations, your, your keyboard would give you some recommendations, but also the search engine would give you some, some recommendations. So let's say you search for Siri technology, you get this page, um, and then when you click on it, sometimes you get these highlighted sort of notes. I asked people which step in this process used a language model. Um, and in an audience like this, I think you would uh, realize that this is maybe a, a trick question. And it's in all of them, uh, a language model was used. So um, 
uh, auto complete and sort of uh, next word uh, can be used via, let's say, uh, language models. Um, this summarization uh, and highlighting, uh, these are all sort of language model uh, tasks. But there's even one that is more important, which is where sort of Google got you the results. So to give some sort of uh, examples, yes, so we, some of these tasks are, let's say, autocomplete, text summarization, question answering, semantic search. Um, and if you use Gmail, you have some of these um, suggested responses. That's response selection. That's also another thing that language models are, are, are heavily used for. So we're not talking about specific just research um, or you know, interesting ideas. Uh, these are heavily in application right now, just even Less than less than a year since like one of these papers is written, it it goes into into industry um, really quickly. So this is sort of across the board: Google Translate, search, uh, all the speech detection, um, and then using it in 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 search as well. Uh, so like a year, I think after the Bert paper was out, um, the Google search team said that it. it Implementing, let's say, semantic search using a model like BERT represented the biggest leap forward in the past five years and one of the biggest leaps forward in the history of search. Uh, GPT-3 took the world by storm. So many interesting applications there. Uh, I think most of, of the team here has, has, has looked at it. So to think about uh, transformer uh, language models uh, for a second, let's look at uh, one of the developments that, that uh, have changed the game. Um, that it broke down this training process into two steps. One is pre-training where a model is trained on a lot of data um, and then you fine tune it, you train it further for, for a specific uh, use case. Uh, so if you want to create, let's say a new um, semantic or uh, sentiment analysis, let's say classifier, you don't have to train a model from scratch. Uh, you can train a model that already understands English or multilingual or whatever language that you're. So these are one of the. This is one of the uh, developments, sort of that that made these these models um, revolutionary. Um, the training process of a language model, and I'm here speaking about a, a what's typically called a language model, which is an autoregressive language model, kind of like GPT. It's trained on a on a very basic task, which is you give it, let's say, three tokens or three words and uh, you hold off what the correct, correct word is. So a robot must obey, uh, but you don't tell it to obey. You just give it the three tokens uh, or three words. It will make a prediction. The model is not trained, so it will output a random output. We know what the actual output that we are expecting is. We calculate the error, we update the model, um, and then we do this for a lot of uh, tokens, 300 billion in, in GPT-3's case. And then once you've pre-trained it, you can deploy it or fine tune it or prompt engineer it for, for these other uh, use cases. To tackle the, the architecture a little bit, um, I've always felt that it's easier to look at it as just one black box. And the initial transformer uh, was about um, translation. So you give it a, a sentence in, Eng in, in French and it, it outputs a, a sentence in English. So uh, you can visualize it kind of like this. And then if you were to look under the hood, it has two major components, an encoder and a decoder. And these encoder and decoder are, are made up of, of blocks, uh, six blocks in the encoder and six in the decoder. That's the initial sort of transformer paper. Um, and then these are the main architectural ideas um, I think they're good to establish first before thinking about different types of transformers. So the initial transformer was an encoder decoder model. So that works really well for say, things like um, machine translation, uh, but also there are still models that are you know, continuing to, to uh, tackle this, this structure. So it's still very useful uh, on certain uh, use cases. So T5, T0 that was sort of recently uh, developed as well is, is these encoder decoder. Um, and I think Mina, Google AI's large um, chatbot is, is one of these encoder decoder models. On the other hand, you have models that are trained completely using decoders. Uh, so these are the, your, your GPT models uh, that are just like the traditional uh, autoregressive um, 
models. And then you have BERT-like uh, models structured using only the encoder sort of stack. Um, and that is tends to be called masked language modeling. So you have language models, masked language models, and you have like encoder decoder uh, transformers. So this is uh, to, to orient yourself. And all of these are widely in use. Uh, a lot of them are, have specific tasks that they do better in uh, than, than the others. Uh, our talk will focus um, on the transformer uh, language model. Uh, so this is going to be um, the type of model that we focus on. Um, another idea uh, is how many layers can you sort of stack? How many blocks can you can you stack? And BERT large has about 24. Uh, GPT-2 large has about 36. Uh, so these are another aspect, let's say, of transformers is, uh, so you can talk about how large the, the neural networks inside are, but also how many uh, blocks that you, you stack to get your model. So let's talk about language models. Um, I found that there's a, a two really good examples to, to break down the components of a, a transformer uh, layer. So let's think about a model that has, let's say, only one, one layer. If you give the model an example of uh, this input, which is the Shawshank, um, and then this model is trained, so it has hopefully seen uh, words kind of like this or phrases kind of like this before. Um, you would be able to think that it, it is able to guess what the next word is. And this is a, a reference to uh, the film, The Shawshank Redemption. Um, and I, I tried this using the uh, distilled GPT-2 uh, example. And when you pass it the Shawshank, it gives you this completion. So it's able to actually know what word I was expecting um, after uh, Shawshank. And this really explains to you one of the two major components of a transformer block, which is the feed-forward neural network. So in the training, when the model was trained on vast amounts of, of data uh, previously, it, it is able to calculate these probabilities of words appearing after the current context that you have. Uh, so two words here, what would the third be? And this is a, a very similar, so this is not new as a technology in transformers. This is very similar to previous uh, language models. And then uh, three grams and n grams uh, that were calculated using just counting how many times uh, this word has appeared before sort of, uh, or after this context and creating a probability uh, distribution or score via that. So this is one of the two major components, the feed forward neural network. And this is an example where it shines. It was able to sort of um, remember or have a calculation of what the next word would be, just judging on what the model has seen before. Um, this is a, a paper from 2003 about these models uh, and how they, they were there sort of uh, previously and uh, transformers build on, on top of this. Now, the second component is a little bit co more complex and this is a great example to uh, illustrate it. So when you say the chicken did not cross the road because it, and you want the model to complete what the next word would be. Now, the model cannot only calculate you know, what words usually appear after the word it. Um, that would not uh, produce a really good model. It would not be able to fit its data set uh, really well. And before it sort of uh, does that, um, it needs to resolve, what does it refer to here? Does it refer to the chicken or does it refer to the road? So that ambiguity is, is, a, is, a, is there. And we can throw this as at a small GPT uh, example, and we can see if we say the, the chicken didn't cross the road because it was covered in grass. So that's probably the road, right? Um, he thought the sun wasn't so bad. Then, I, then now I don't know. Maybe it was. Maybe the chicken was covered in grass, and the, the, the sun was not so bad. So this is sort of a good example of this other component of a transformer block, which is self-attention. What self-attention does is that when the model is processing this token, self-attention associates it either with the chicken or with the road or with a mixture of both. And really, that it's a mixture of, of the entire um, sentence. Um, so that is one of the major things that Transformers brought, uh, I guess, to NLP, in addition to um, being easier and better to run in parallel. Uh, as compared to RNNs, which were 
um, used heavily before sort of transformers took over. So these are the two components, self-attention, which, uh, you know, whenever you're processing a token, it bakes the, uh, in its understanding or representation of that token, uh, relevant information from other um, uh, parts of, of the input. Um, and then feed forward, which is uh, neural network, which is um, builds on top of that. The idea of tokenization is another uh, important one. Uh, so the example that I showed you here was a little bit simplified. When I actually throw the Shawshank at the uh, tokenizer of GPT-2 is what I'm using here, it would break it down kind of like this. So these two words would be four tokens. And then a, through the tokenizer, that would be translated into token IDs. Um, and these token IDs will be the ones that are uh, hitting the, the model. And then the model outputs something that we can translate into a, a word using the token again. And so if you're to, to work with, with BERT or GPT models, these are the two, let's say, components, pieces of code um, uh, that, that you'll have to uh, deal with. The tokenizer, which translates between our words and let's say token IDs and the actual model, which has never seen any words, has only seen token IDs. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you to be able to um, go through the uh, notebook. Um, and this is sort of a, a, an interesting uh, idea that I thought. Uh, so GPT-3, this was one of the, let's say, outputs of, of GPT-3 saying, to be clear, I'm not a person. I'm not self-aware. I'm not conscious. I can't feel pain. Uh, I don't enjoy anything. I am cold calculating machine designed to simulate a human response. So this and other sort of interesting generations from, from massive uh, language models are very interesting if you can think of them as, um, you know, these were outputted by a machine. Now, definitely should be suspicious uh, until you see sort of what the prompt was, uh, but it's still interesting. Uh, but what's more interesting is that the model has never actually seen language. It has only seen word, like it, it, token IDs, kind of like this. So when the model says this, actually, this is what it, its output is. It has never touched or seen uh, words, but it just is able to model sequences, let's say, of, of numbers and then um, embeddings. Embeddings is the, is the next uh, idea here, which is breathing uh, meaning into numbers, into these token IDs. Um, and so when you download, let's say, the, the GPT model, you would get with it a table of, uh, let's say, vocabulary size and, and embedding for each word that the model knows or each token that in, in the model's vocabulary. Uh, this is how you can look at it. I don't know if this is up to date with the latest uh, versions, but. Uh, it was when I was sort of looking at it. So, and you can just pass it, let's say the token ID. So this is the token ID of the word the, and you can, if you're like me and just you're curious and you want to look at these numbers, do they make sense? They look like this. So we have our words, uh, they're converted into tokens. Through embedding, they're converted into vectors, kind of like the numbers that, that, that we saw previously. And these are really the input into the transformer block. Uh, and if the input is, let's say, four tokens, you'd have these four tracks going through the transformer block and an output at each one. And then however many blocks that you have, you can sort of, uh, each block works on the output of the, of the previous one. And these are called hidden states. When, you, when you're doing uh, text generation, uh, the one that you, you predict uh, the next token using this final one. So if we're predicting, let's say, the word uh, redemption, it would the model would be working off of this final hidden state of the final token. Okay, so how do we turn computation into into language? How do we project the output into into language? And it looks kind of like this. So where this is the last hidden state um, of the last token. So the model has processed it done a lot of crunching, and then it outputs this, this one vector. Uh, the, let's say, language model head would, would project that. So it would give a score to each word in its vocabulary, each token in its vocabulary. And we just pick the highest one, or we can. That's one type of, of uh, output selection. There are other decoding strategies is, is, is the word for this. But uh, say you just pick the highest one, that would be the word redemption. Um, 
So now you scale it, and that's how you sort of have these massive um, uh, language models. They uh, process all of the all of these tokens, and then in the end they give you an output, and you feed that auto regressively. So this token that comes out is fed back into the model, and that's how the model continues to produce token after token. Hey, Jay, I have a question um, yes. about scaling. So what do you mean by this? Is this uh, scaling like the architecture or do you, are there other things we should consider when we talk about scaling transformers? Yes, exactly. So I'm talking about how do you go from, let's say, GPT-2 to GPT-3. Uh, so you have larger models, larger uh, training sets. Um, and then like right. even like, you, you, tra you, you layer a higher, let's say, number of, of layers, or more, more transformer blocks. Great. And then a kind of follow up question would be, um, so at Cohere, I think you mentioned you, you, you guys are also training large language models yourself. Yes. And so I'm kind of wondering, like, what kind of considerations go into curating the data sets um, when, you're, when you're doing this? Because we know that GPT-3, for example, has a wide set of kind of known biases and can lead to some kind of generations that maybe are sort of harmful or offensive yeah. and so on. And I'm just kind of yeah. curious how, how you guys think about this. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. So there's the the team works on uh, filtering the the data sets for 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 toxicity. I think there's a there's a paper also uh, there that I can I can share uh, after uh, with the team. So uh, exactly that that filtering of of the data set uh, is, is a very important component that leads to models uh, hopefully that that can produce better generations. Awesome, thank you. Amazing, thank you so much. Ah, so was that the end of your talk? That is the end of my talk. Oh, great. Cool, cool. Great. So we have a few more questions um, on the forums. So this one is is more of a, um, let's say, general question. I'll put it here in the chat. So do you see a future in symbolic learning rather than probabilistic approaches? And I think this is kind of like, you know, the, the big topic on Twitter between Gary Marcus and... Um, you know, other people who are like connectionists. And I'm curious to see what your thoughts are. True. Yeah, I don't have sort of m much of a, an opinion. I think we can probably use a little bit of both. The probabilistic has really proven itself. So I don't think you can go without the probabilistic. But can you infuse it with uh, a little bit more rules? Like that's what we see in chatbots, uh, so to speak. You can use some of the probabilistic, but you, you have to sort of encode uh, some, some, of the, some of your rules. Uh, to to be actually have something that you can, let's say, ship out to your customers now. Yeah, I think a kind of very related question here is whether like transformers or you know deep neural networks in general can do true extrapolation, um, and you know whether we're just doing interpolation on some sort of you know manifold in a lower dimension. And I, I think this is generally what the symbolists are always you know wanting us to you know pay attention to. <laughs> But true, yeah. true, and there's there's some work on on causal sort of inference uh, that's been sort of dripping more and more into in, into NLP, and that sort of maybe goes beyond uh, just let's say correlation into maybe encoding some of the, some of the of the causation. Cool. So another question we have here is um, so you know your blog, as I mentioned at the start, has kind of helped everyone visually understand what's going on under the hood. And sort of what concept or architecture is like next on your on your list? Yeah, so a lot of what I focus on, especially sort of in my, my work with Cohere, is how do we get the best results from these models in the real world? And how do we apply them to, to real world problems? So um, I've been thinking about things like, you know, what, what are the best ways to explain and think about things like prompt engineering? Um, and, you know, what's the best way to sort of, you know, fine tune um, the, a model? What should the data set sort of... Uh, look like. So a lot of it, I've, I've been sort of thinking about the applied side um, for a while now, and that sort of gives me some e exposure into things like, um, or areas that are interesting, both on generation, but also on the embedding side, kind of like dense retrieval and semantic search. Um, and these are sort of, you know, very interesting uh, applications of, of models, both of the BERT uh, and the, the GPT uh, types. Awesome. I think we have another question here. It's a bit of a long one. Uh, we'll see if I can just read it out. It doesn't quite fit. So um, it says, <clears throat> let's see. So for T5, um, there's been around three approaches that have been used to fine tune pre-trained models for all downstream tasks. So this is kind of like where you fine tune all of the layers or you just freeze some layers 
or you know, do gradual unfreezing. And the question is that for models like BERT, um, which are more these encoder-based models, um, which of these approaches do you think is best, you know, kind of using freezing or just, just fine-tuning the whole thing? Yeah, so it's a trade-off. It's really a trade-off. So you can you can get some value without fine-tuning. You, you can fit some classifiers on top of the frozen model to begin with. You can freeze some layers and uh, train, let's say, the final layers, and you can fine-tune the entire thing. Um, but the more like fine-tuning that you do, the more training that you do, that will take more time. It will might need uh, a little bit more data. Uh, there isn't a one-size-fits-all. Unfortunately, in machine learning, most of the answers are always you know, depends on the case. Exactly. And, and I think this is kind of very closely related to this follow-up question, which is sort of how, how do we know how much we should fine tune a pre-trained model? So are there some like general like heuristics or strategies that you sort of think about when you're doing fine tuning? So fine tuning is a different is a different beast. So it's a word that can use different things. The, it depends on the complexity of the task that you want the model to accomplish. So um, if the model has been has come across your task uh, in uh, its training set, for example, then you don't need a lot of fine tuning. Because if you, let's say, get data from the web and you train the model to do language modeling on it, it would see some things like paragraph and then in summary and then a sum summary under it. So it wouldn't need a lot of data to grasp the, the concept of, of, let's say, summarization because it was already sort of kind of trained on it. But if you have something where uh, the, the relationship between the input that you want and the output is, is, is difficult, uh, then you will need a, a bit more sort of data. And it's, it's similar to a, however you want to fit uh, features and labels in a general machine learning uh, algorithm. If the relationship is easy, if it's sort of uh, the model is able to do it with less data. If it's complex, um, then that's, you know, you might need infinite data for it. Exactly. And I, I think this is also perhaps why everyone has got so excited about models like GPT-3 because they kind of showed, like in Tom's talk, he mentioned this kind of curve where you can see, you know, the performance as a function of number of examples. And in the few shot case where you only need 10 examples and you're still, you know, almost, you know, several tens of points better than, than everything else, this is quite impressive. And maybe just one last question for you, because Echo here, I guess you're doing few shot learning, is do, do you see this technique of like prompt engineering or few shot learning becoming kind of as commonplace in industry um, as, you know, the current paradigm we use of, you know, collecting several thousand examples and, you know, training our classifiers on it? Yeah, so it is, and it depends on on the use case, and it it's really better for some use cases uh, rather than than others. Uh, you can have a lot of let's say cases where you don't have that data, or it's very difficult. But that relationship is somehow encoded through uh, examples that the model has has seen before. So it's uh, for people without a lot of data sets, uh, few shot learning is one thing to 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 experiment with. It is convenient, uh, but it has that it's. Uh, Again, it's empir empirical and experimental uh, sort of in nature. Uh, but if you have only five or 10 uh, or 50 examples, uh, it's, it's worth experimenting with it if, if it's too expensive for you to actually get enough of a data set to train a full model. Totally. So that's, uh, I think, all the questions we have from the community right now. And uh, thank you once again for this beautiful talk and for taking part in this event. I think uh, everyone really enjoys it. Um, seeing your your amazing slides and images. Amazing. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, love all, all your work. Happy to be here. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Jay.